And um, Gog Tag Alice Salmon, have I got that right? Yes. yes, yes. I have a very good friend who's Greek and she's taught me quite a few Greek things. Unfortunately, I sound too Greek. So if I do speak to Greek people, I say, ah, kalispera, tikainis. They think I'm Greek, so then they s s throw sound at me for like 30 seconds and I'm thinking, I have no idea what you're saying. So I nod politely and then they just look at me quizzically and expectantly and then I just have to go away. So good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about horror, sound and music uh, today, uh, following on from a lot of what um, Joe's Brilliant talk did. And by the way, I never thought I'd have uh, Joe Hill as a warm-up man on my bucket <laughs> list. So thank you very much. Um, but before um, we sort of get started, really, um, a bit of audience participation. Now, I, I know if you're anything like me, the thought of audience participation fills me with complete dread. Not recreational fear, just dread. Uh, but I promise you this is quite harmless. So what I've got is I've got some uh, tunes which are clips from horror scores and really I'd just like you to tell me where you think they come from. So they're very short clips. Um, one of them is really easy. If you don't get that, leave the room because <laughs> you've no place anywhere near recreational fear. One of them is actually, well I think it's quite hard, but if you do know it, I guarantee I will do your laundry for a month uh, and I'll pay for it uh, as well. So are we ready? Okay, so this is the, now fingers crossed this is going to work. Right. Of course, <laughs> that's, that's the easy one. <laughs> well actually the, the, the second one is also quite famous. You have to listen quite carefully to this one because it's, it's a very bad sound clip but it's also very brief. So what about this one? Jaws, of course. <laughs> famous Austin Otto, probably the most famous Austin Otto in, um, um, I think, in film history, uh, that one. Number three, oops, here we go. It's Barbie. You're too good at this, Joe. I, I fear I'm going to be doing your dry cleaning for quite a while. <laughs> um, did Edward say it over here, actually? I think I said it wrong. No, what did you say? Dexter. Oh, no, I thought somebody did say it. Peaky Blinders. Well, yes. <laughs> but before Peaky Blinders, there was uh, this. Where's Craven's Finest Hour? Uh, Not Nightmare, the other one. I thought you might have got this one, because I thought this was one of the moderate two easy ones. No? Do you want to hear it again? Yeah. So it's not, you're right, it is uh, used in Peaky Blinders as well, but um, not Peaky Blinders though. Takes a while to warm up. Shall I put you out of your misery? Yeah. yeah. Scream. <laughs> I did say Wes Craven's finest hour. Come on, it's a bit of a clue. Um, now this one I think is quite difficult. So if you do get this one, brilliant. Sort of has brought the mood down a little bit, hasn't it? Really? <laughs> Let's bring it back up. So, any idea what that might be? Uh, I will tell you, it's the best horror film ever made. Uh, uh, no, no arguing. Frankenstein. Not Frankenstein. Uh, stars Vincent Price. 1973. Shakespeare. Yeah. <laughs> um, that was one of the really good Corman's, Corman films, wasn't it? Wasn't it a Corman film? It's Hickox, a, but very similar to Corman, murders. though. He does yeah. all the and just lifted from the plays. Yes, uh, yes. Something in Blood. Yes. 
<laughs> one more word. Uh, uh, it's on the Actually, have you had them all right so far? Because I don't want to encourage you to do the dry cleaning thing again. It's Barbie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, Joe, it's not Barbie. Barbie. It's actually much better than Barbie. It's <laughs> Theatre of Blood, which you haven't, if you haven't seen, anybody seen Theatre of Blood, by the way? No. <gasps> Someone in the chat Maybe? got it right. Really? Oh, I was about to say, Mark, if anybody in Zoom also uh, wants to have a guess. Brilliant. Well done, that person. Um, who was it? Do we have a name for? David. David. Yeah. Brilliant. David. Um, <laughs> no dry cleaning. That doesn't apply to Zoom. <laughs> Terms and conditions <laughs> apply. Um, <laughs> Uh, yes, if you haven't seen it, as, as Joe actually said, it's about a ham Shakespearean actor. He uh, doesn't win a very famous London bauble from the London critic circle. It goes to a younger actor. He fakes his own death. He's saved by a group of winos. All of this is true. And then he comes back and he kills off each of the critics using scenes from Shakespeare's plays. It is an absolute work of genius. It's Graham Hickox is the, the, the director. And it is brilliant. It's actually free on YouTube as well. Not that I should tell you that. But if you want to have a look at that, it is absolutely phenomenal. Okay. So, back to the presentation then. Um, as a uh, psychologist, I'm often asked, you know, why do you study horror? Um, in fact, as a psychologist, I am never asked, why do you study horror? <laughs> uh, my PhD was on the brain's response to food aroma, so it's a pretty normal question to ask, I would have thought. Um, but if I were to be asked, I would defer to Dr. Jonathan Crane, who said, uh, as I grew, my passions for causing fear and books intertwined. I studied evil terror, man's inhumanity to man, and naturally, I became a <laughs> professor of psychology. But um, fear is the most widely studied of the basic emotions in psychology. Um, various theorists have different views about what constitutes a basic emotion. The current taxonomy, there's agreement on about six. Uh, fear is widely studied because it's the most easy to study. You can study it in animals and also its behavioural manifestations tend to be quite stereotypical and fairly well delineated, unlike um, many of the other uh, emotions. And touching on what Joe was saying earlier, psychology has sort of had a tenderness taboo up until about the last 30 years, where the focus was actually on negative emotions, you know, fear, anxiety, depression, PTSD, and all of these things. And quite rightly, I suppose, because these cause distress, and so you want to help people experience less distress and less anxiety. In the last 30 odd years or so, you know, psychologists have moved on, on to laughter and comedy and happiness and surprise and so on. So it's the easiest to study. There's a mass of literature on actual fear itself. However, as you all know, I think, there's very little material on recreational fear. And one of the brilliant things that Matthias does here at Arjos is not only has he created the world's first lab on recreational fear, he's created the world's only lab <laughs> on recreational fear. Um, and I've said this to him before, so he's not going to be embarrassed, but you know that Matthias's background isn't psychology, it's literature. But he produces the best psychology work on this topic anywhere. I mean, it's a brilliant achievement. Um, there are a couple of books I could maybe recommend, uh, rather fine uh, examples here. Um, and it's interesting that when I looked at uh, the literature on the psychological response to horror film, I was amazed that, in fact, you could put all of that literature into a 12-page review article, which is the one that Matthias uh, referred to. Um, so there's not much of it, and also a lot of it is pretty bad. Um, and it's very, methodologically, extremely poor. I mean, the stuff that Matthias does here is, has rigour, it's done very well, large samples, you know, what a standard good psychology experiment should be. And I think, I don't think psychologists have shied away from recreational fear for these reasons, but I think it is true, or at least it has been true, that horror has suffered from sort of being the Cinderella of the, the film genre world. I mean, there's a certain snobbery and disdain that has accompanied, you know, perceptions of horror. And these are just some quotes that I think illustrate that. Um, the horror film and horror literature, according to this author, is generally ignored, sometimes acknowledged with bemused tolerance and viewed with alarm when it irritates authority. A taste of horror is a taste for something seemingly abnormal. You're all abnormal, by the way, according to <laughs> Tudor, and is therefore deemed to require special attention. And my favorite quote, uh, horror, is like the mad woman in the attic. And the Academy, 
more or less reflects this disdain or neglect, let's not over uh, generalise just yet, um, of the Best Picture film nominations. Only seven horror films have been nominated, only two have won. Um, 1992 was a bumper year for Silence of the Lambs and Parasite of course was the other one. And the, the nominees were actually pretty good uh, films. So there seems to be a sort of slightly sniffy attitude amongst what is the premier professional um, industry academy towards horror. So the, the recognition doesn't seem to be there. Christopher Young, the uh, composer, film, uh, horror film composer, said that horror films are a bit like the unwanted bastard stepchildren of Hollywood. So horror must be thinking, why do they hate me? Why? <laughs> However, something very interesting I think has happened in the last 10 years or so. Um, in 2017, um, it made sales of $700 million, uh, the most successful, at that time, the most successful horror film ever made. Um, the, the sequel made $185 million in the first week. Uh, 14 R-rated horror films have made more than 100 million. 15, this is in the US, 15 of the top 200 financially successful R-rated films have been horror. Globally, it's 27. But look at this piece of data. 12 of them were released between um, 2016 and 2021. Something is happening in the world of horror, and I think we like it. Um, and I think in tandem with what's been going on, you've had you know, the, the generation and the development of specific film houses like Blumhouse and A24 um, and streamers like Shudder, as well as horror film that are mainstream horror film. They're not idiosyncratic, they're not niche, they're not Texas Chainsaw Massacre, you know, or The Last House on the Left. They're things like the, um, the, the Black Phone, written by, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it'll come to me. Um, and Censor and uh, Nod to Denmark, Midsummer, um, as well as all these, these are just a small selection of films you know, I could have cited, as well as uh, yeah, TV series like Stranger Things and uh, Squid Game and so on. So there seems to be a renaissance, and as Joe has remarked somewhere else, uh, it's been a great decade for horror. So something does seem to be happening. And also there are many film festivals around the world now dedicated to horror. I mean, Fright Fest is coming up in London um, later on this month. And there are also uh, quite a few magazines. In fact, the one I haven't put on is Fangoria, which I should have, which is the biggest one, I suppose. But it had a bit of a hiatus and then came back as like a coffee table thing. It's massive and very expensive. Um, in fact, just on Sunday, you see the dark side at the top. On Sunday, I was speaking to the editor of the dark side and he now has so much material that he can barely publish what he has. Uh, you know, people want to read about horror and they, um, they want to write about it. And of course the return that you get on uh, horror films can be phenomenal. Um, horror has a reputation for being as cheap as chips to bake, so a lot of filmmakers start out doing horror film shorts and they cut their teeth on that sort of genre because, you know, no exotic costumes are involved, no expensive visual effects. Um, the Blair Witch Project is probably the most famous example of this, which was made on a budget of just tens of thousands and made an enormous amount of money. But the granddaddy of them all is... Any guesses? Night of the Living Dead? No. That's out of copyright, interestingly. Really? You know that story about he didn't put copyright? Perhaps. Yeah. And so anybody can use it and manipulate it and do all sorts. Um, Couple of Holocaust? Couple of Holocaust. Uh, no. No, although you've just reminded me that Theatre of Blood clip is very similar to Riz Ortolani's score for Cannibal Holocaust. Uh, anyone seen Ho Cannibal Holocaust? Yeah, it is the most incongruous soundtrack you will ever hear because Riz Ortolani's sort of lush sweeping strings, it's, it's a beautiful score. And, you know, in the film, you know, they sort of hack turtles and stick poles up each other. It's weird. Anyway, so um, any idea what the most successful? Could be paranormal activity. Yes. The granddaddy of them all. Um, it, it made over a million and a quarter percent return uh, on its original budget. Um, and you know what, I think it is one of the best found footage uh, films. I love found footage and I think this is the best example. Every time it's on television, which it is often in the UK, um, I, I still watch. And when that door slams when they're in bed, it still gets me. You know, the hairs of the back of my neck start prickling. 
So the soup thickens. What is all this disdain given the uh, popularity of uh, horror? Which brings us sort of really to sound and music and horror itself. Because I thought, well, if the Academy is rather sniffy about horror in general, what about horror film scores? Because they presumably tend to be rather conventional. I mean, it's a horror film score. They don't seem to be that much different from um, scores for other films. And we know, and Joe mentioned this earlier, we know that sound plays an enormous part in horror. Some have argued that horror is in fact a sound-based medium. And again, as you probably know, there are two uses of sound and music in film. There's the diegetic use, which is what the characters can hear. And then there's the uh, non-diegetic use, which is what we can hear as an audience. So the soundtrack, for example. And the most famous um, sort of non-diegetic uh, sound, probably the most famous sound phenomenon in film, is the jump scare. Which, as Joe said earlier, was, you know, quite, quite, quite bang. I mean, really cheap way to, to get a, a, a jump scare and uh, produces a startle reflex, which is, you know, the um, psychologists always have terms for things, but it creates uh, what's called a startle reflex. And the thing about the music is, obviously, it allows us to, it influences what we see, and it does, but it also changes our emotion and our cognition. So it changes the way that we think and the way that uh, we feel. And some have argued that, well, maybe the role of a film score is uh, threefold. So one, it establishes the passage of time, sense of time and place, it establishes a context for the film, and it invokes and manipulates mood, which is where we come in. Aaron Copeland uh, once commented that by itself the screen is a pretty cold proposition. Music is like a small flame put under the screen to warm it. Boris Karloff, on the other hand, said background music is an insult to the intelligence of the audience. The mood should be conveyed by action and not have to be underlined. Um, now, far be it for me to argue with a man who normally has boats in his neck, uh, but I'm going to. Um, rather weirdly, this is a bit of a tangent, I was going to mention this, but a few years ago I was doing like an open day for a school in London, like a public boys' school, and it turns out Boris Karloff was one of the alumnus of that uh, school. Ah, see, everything links in a way, doesn't it? Kismet. So here are some empirical studies on the influence of film music on people's perception of film. Um, one small caveat, I promise you this is the most, the only text-heavy slide in the presentation. Uh, the, what follows is going to be slightly prettier. But what you have here is a summary of some of the more interesting things that some uh, people have found about the influence of music on how we see film. Another caveat, many of these studies are based on very small samples, um, so you need to interpret the conclusions with a bit of caution, apart from the last one, which I'll come to in a second. So what have people found then? Well, um, one study added thriller music to a neutral clip with a neutrally performing uh, character, and found that the audience perceived that character more negatively. They attributed more negative personality traits to, to that person. Um, there was a study of Billy Wilder's The Lost Weekend that again um, imposed different types of music onto a scene and that influenced where viewers thought the film would go. So, you know, the imposition of the music had a direct effect on their perception. Another study uh, interpolated happy, fearful, sad and, what was the other one, angry music before and after um, a neutrally performing character was in a film. And again, the viewer's perception was congruous with the emotion of the score. So they thought the neutral film, if they'd listened to sad music, was a, a sad scene and so on. I might come back to the Kuleshov effect uh, a bit later. And the three most important bits of music are the timbre, the rhythm, um, and the, the pitch. And there's some good evidence that in fact these can discriminate between um, horror, uh, between film score genres with about 61% accuracy. Tombra is the best predictor, but not really of horror. Uh, horror tends to be, if you look at the, these two features of uh, auditory features of sound, these um, three don't distinguish between drama and horror very well. However, Horror is easily distinguishable from romance, <laughs> which is a bit of a relief if you're uh, you talking about Sleepless in Seattle with a sort of <laughs> jump scares, do you? Um, and then lastly, um, some very good work by Caitlin, who's coming up a bit later on um, this afternoon. So I don't want to steal her thunder, but she did a very interesting study published this year where she looked at two different subtypes of um, horror 
namely terrifying music and anxiety provoking music. And what she found was that the terrifying music was brighter, rougher, harsher in timbre, um, musically denser, faster and louder than the music that um, invoked anxiety. Uh, it was also rhythmically unpredictable as well. So there's some very interesting um, experiments showing how uh, music can influence uh, what we see. Which brings us to the, the question really I wanted to um, ask and to try and answer here today with you all. And that is, well, is the Academy rather sniffy about horror scores? I mean, does it award the best score picture to um, other genres more than it does horror? So I had a look at the data. Before I show you the data, very brief history of the Oscars, and I mean very brief, just one slide. Um, they were first uh, awarded in 1929. The first music category was introduced in 1935, uh, which is best scoring. Then there was best original score in 39. Then it split off in 42. I mean, the history of this category in the Oscars is schizophrenia isn't the right word, but it's certainly multiple personality disorder. I mean, it goes everywhere. Uh, so it was split off into two categories in 42. And then between 42 and 85, about 19 different variants of the music category um, have been used at uh, one time or another. Best original score was introduced in 71. Then there was a hiatus, then came back in 76 until 95. Another change happened. And then since 2000, that's the category that's been uh, used for this award. And in order to be classified as original, the Academy states that 35% of the score uh, must be original, which is why one film last year didn't get nominated, even though people thought that film should have been nominated. Which film was it? The one with the aggressive drumming teacher, whose name escapes me. Can you remember? Whiplash. No, uh, female, female lead. This was last year. Whiplash was... Ta. Ta. Yes. Brilliant. So yes, it was tar. Um, so that was uh, proposed, that was put forward by the, the filmmakers, but didn't have enough original uh, music in it. Um, and in fact, that's why Best Original Score was originally introduced by the Academy, is that there was controversy back in, I think it was 1935, when the winning um, entry just was made up mainly of clips from other people's composers. So, uh, yeah, weird decision. So I had a look at the, um, the BFI's genre a categorization for genres of film and the BFI identifies 17 um, different and distinct genres of film and here they are comedy action animation fantasy sci-fi biopic thriller drama family adventure horror war romance music dance crime documentary and western so I classified uh, well I'll tell you about that in a second so I used this classification system to um, determine what was uh, horror and what wasn't. Um, I looked at all the films that won the best Oscar for the uh, best score or its variant from 1935 to 2022. 664 films, uh, not categorised as musicals, because that's a different category, have been nominated for best score. Um, who said research was easy? God, this was... <laughs> Oh, there's so much paper <laughs> doing this. Oh, is. So, the winner is... Uh, oh, any guesses, by the way? Which, do you think... Well, first of all, do you think any genre would have been nominated more than any other? And if you do, any idea what genre that might be? Let me just get those... There you go, back up for you. Drama? Drama. Drama. <laughs> do I detect a consensus? <laughs> so, basically, it's, it's drama. Okay, nobody think like Western or documentary. No? Total, total, my very good answer. <laughs> yeah. You can always write a pathologist to, 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 to ruin your presentation. Maybe like uh, fantasy, sci-fi, yeah. Star Wars. Okay. So let's have a look then. And how do you think horror would perform, by the way? So do, do you think... You know, the, the, the snobbery. So how much? Seven. Seven percent. Ooh, that's, a, that's a very good, if precise, guess. Yes. Um, anyone else think it's going to be that low? I, it's going gonna, it's gonna to suffer as badly as best picture? Lower. Lower? Okay. Right, let's... 
Let's have a look. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you've got to love a prop. Okay. You? Right, here we go. And the winner is... Uh, well, actually, not my printer, because that's blank. So, <laughs> these, are, well, well, these are the actual winners. So there you go. So you're right, whoever said drama, which is like most of you, um, that was the most successful category in terms of uh, Oscar wins for best score, followed by romance, music, dance, fantasy, adventure. And then as you go down the tally, you can see our good friend Horror was there at the bottom, but also with two other friends. So at least it's not that lonely. Um, so thriller and crime. It wasn't even the worst performing genre. Because <laughs> documentary and biopic, nothing, not at all. Uh, so if you're writing music for documentary and biopics, any of you, don't even think of winning an Oscar because it's not going to happen. So I thought, okay, well that's interesting. But then I thought, well, why is this? I mean, thriller, crime, horror, mm, they're quite R-rated, aren't they? They're sort of mature films for mature audiences, adults. So maybe the Academy is rather sniffy and dismissive about R-rated films, not horror, just R-rated films in general. So I had a look. So I went through every film um, that uh, won and sought the classification. Uh, and before I tell you what the results were, um, which were interesting, in total about 1.65 uh, percent of the nominees were horror films. So even the nominations themselves, I mean, the, I've just shown you the wins, but the nominations for horror were actually quite low. Uh, it's about under 2 percent. The 70s and 80s were particularly rewarding, particularly between 1935 and 1970. There were quite a few nominations then. Well, I say rel quite a few, relatively quite a few nominations. There were none in the 50s and the 60s. And between 95 and 2022, no nominations at all for horror film scores. And, you know, horror film scores aren't that bad. I mean, some of them are pretty good. So in terms of the... Um, oh, and then I'll, I'll, these are the, the actual winners. Uh, when Horror was nominated, uh, which are the films here on the, uh, the third column, these are the actual winners on the right-hand side in those years. So the two horror films, as you can see, are Jaws um, and The Omen. Um, two very good scores. So in terms of the data on R-rated pictures then, well, since 1968, which is when these classifications were introduced, um, the best picture has gone to R-rated films more often than any other film. 58% of best picture films are R-rated. And when you look at score, uh, the, uh, the winner for best score, there's actually not much of a difference there either. I mean, R-rated scores, R-rated films, scores from R-rated uh, films, about 33% of those were best picture, compared with 31 for PG. So it's not as if the Academy disli dislikes adult-themed films as such, or, you know, films with adult themes. So it makes you think, well, what is different then about a horror score? Is there anything different about a, a horror score? And I think there is. And it's not my view either, it's the views of composers of horror films. Because um, horror film scores tend to be quite utilitarian, they tend to be coarse, they tend to be purposeful, restricted and focused, because they have an aim. And that aim is to heighten fear and to cause dread. It's a very functional score, unlike you know, many other scores. Um, Christopher Young, again, who composed the uh, score for um, Hellraiser and Urban Legend said the music needs to deliver the scares in places that without it that scare won't happen. Nathan Barr, hostile composer, said it has got to scare the shit out of the audience. Um, not mincing his words, Nathan. He's mm. quite bold in his uh, conclusions. And uh, finally, Charles Bernstein composed Nightmare on Elm Street. It has got to uh, it's, you need to jolt the audience in a horror movie in ways that you don't in other kinds of movies. Horror movies have their own set of demands that are different from a romance or a historical epic. So I think that's one reason. Second reason is horror scores can be experimental or transgressive. And again, this is something the horror composers themselves um, acknowledge. So um, Nathan Barr again has said that horror is a great place to cut one's teeth as a composer because there's so much experimentation uh, that can go on. I mean, um, uh, Dario Argento, for example, is very famous for telling his composers, composers to ah, just go away and do whatever you want and then come back to me. 
Um, Harry Manfredini, um, uh, Friday the 13th, uh, said all the bets are off, you can do whatever you want, the cupboard is open, that's what's fun about horror films. They are where you really are allowed to get more creative. So there seems to be more creative scope, experimental scope, in uh, horror scores. So I suppose in conclusion then, it doesn't seem as if the Academy is particularly dismissive or disdainful about horror because horror scores, because it also doesn't really award that bauble to other categories like thriller or crime. It's also not that disdainful of R-rated films because it awards best picture to mainly films that are R-rated. I think horror scores are very distinctive and purposeful and maybe that's one of the reasons why they don't receive the recognition that maybe they should and even some composers say it is a bit Mickey Mouse because you know we have a role to play we have to create music that makes people be afraid in fact I think John Carpenter called the music in King Kong you know when King Kong was sort of moving with his big feet and there was music accompanying each step he called that like the Mickey Mousing of uh, music you know it's really laying it on with the trowel so to speak um, but we seem to be living in a time of renaissance. So the last 10 uh, years or so, I've seen, I think, a remarkable renaissance in horror, and it's become more mainstream now, I think. And the next 20 years, I think, will be very, very, very interesting um, to examine. If you're interested in um, horror film composers' thoughts about composing and horror film, I can't recommend highly enough um, well, actually, I can. I am recommending highly enough uh, these two books by Blake Fischera, which are Scored to Death. You can see what he did there. Um, uh, so both of these are, and they are a fantastic collection of interviews with um, almost all the principal living horror film composers. Uh, just a quick word of thanks to uh, a few people here. Um, including Edward Lionheart, which is the character from Theatre of Blood, who really sparked my passion in horror when I saw Theatre of Blood for the first time. It was probably about 10 or 12, and it horrified me and disgusted me in equal measure. There's a scene involving poodles, which I defy you to see and think, oh my giddy art, what am I watching? Forget your sores, that's the scene you want to watch if you want to be disgusted. Um, if you're interested in the preprint on which this presentation is based, then that's the link on Humanities Commons, so that's out for review at the moment so you can all have a, a read and give me feedback if you like <laughs> and if you would like a copy of this presentation or the paper um, then just email me at neil uh, on horror at outlook.com created especially for today uh, and if you're on twitter not x if you're on twitter <laughs> not x i'm not some part of weird some weird gentleman's club um, then I'm still there at that uh, Neil Martin. So do get in touch and send me your thoughts. Finally, last, uh, but by no means least, uh, a big thank you actually to Matthias, not just for inviting me here today. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, to see everyone here and to hear Joe's talk earlier, which I thought was terrific. Um, the work that Matthias does as part of the Recreational Fear Lab is the, the best kind in the world and uh, you know I hope the work continues because we need more of it so I would just like to say thanks for the invitation <laughs> it's us. thank you everyone <laughs>